Welcome back to Sunless Skies. In the last episode, after doing a bunch of stuff with the Forge of Souls, I headed back to the Reach to get rid of my terror, fix my ship, do all that good stuff. The Blue Kingdom has really been beating me up lately. It's hard to exist there. So I'm going to spend some time in the Reach and Eleutheria and so on. Um, for now, I want to head to Eleutheria very soon. But right, right now, we're heading to Old Tom's Well, because after going to the Blue Kingdom, we finished the quest that I had for my ambition there. And with that done, I could return him to the bar at New Winchester and take another person who wants to take the Bathy Sphere to the bottom of Old Tom's Well. So I'm super excited about what we're going to find down there. Like, my god. I was going to wait till I was pretty much there till I started the episode, but something popped up. Remember, we've been... Waiting for something further to happen with the Clay Conductor, since we created their companion to sing with them. It seemed like... Well, we reached the end of what we could do for the moment, but their quest wasn't actually complete. So we were just waiting for the Clay Conductor to do something, and now they have. A fervent knocking. There's a tapping upon your door in the dead of night. The Clay Conductor insists he has to speak to you. My companion does nothing but sing, he complains. My throat is flaking. Unless I'm singing harmonies, they don't talk. They don't listen. They don't care. He pauses for breath. Something must be done. He has come to a decision. Hear them out. He's woken you up for this. It had better be good. I would like them to learn to be more human. The clay conductor lowers his head. I am not suited to the task. Progress with anything other than music is slow. I am not one for, for example, celebrations. He holds out a crumbled piece of paper. His old party hat. I think it might be better if you were to help out. He sticks out his chest. That would leave me to focus on the musical education. They would have my expertise undiluted. He looks in the eye for the first time. If you want to help, that is. Of course I will. <clears throat> hmm, that's interesting. If you refuse, you'll lose the clay conductor, but gain a substantial amount of sovereigns. Is that just the clay conductor paying me for all that I've done for them? Anyway, of course we're going to accept. You'll help the companion learn that there's more to life than singing. The clay conductor beams. I knew you'd see the sense of it. He strides back towards his cabin, bellowing... I shall break the happy news. If any of your crew were not awake, they are now. Over the next few weeks, under your tutelage, the companion becomes a valuable member of the crew. During this time, the conductor begins offering the crew singing lessons. Though a harsh teacher, he's encouraging and patient. Some even become quite good. I think we may have just finished the quest? Um, the Clay Conductor and the Copper Companion have elected to remain on your engine for good. They're permanent additions to your crew. Okay, is that the end, though? Oh, yeah. That, that was the end. Okay, I was expecting something bigger. <laughs> I was expecting a lot of fanfare, but... No, that was that was it. I thought I would have to go somewhere special to, like, teach them to become human, you know? But it was just... I just tutelaged them for a couple weeks and we're good. Clay Conductor and Copper Companion. They come as a pair. Together, they make a much improved first officer. Hmm. Were they a signaler before, or were they... I think they were always a first officer. Anyway, I do want to make 75 mirrors, and now that they give me 10 mirrors, that might do it. Also, how much academia can I get? Two with them. One with them. The villainy, are you academia? No. So I can get three right now. <clears throat> I think that's the most I've been able to get for a while. I think. So if I give up the fortune on Navigator, ooh. <laughs> If I switch the Fortunate Navigator to the uh, Clay Conductor and Copper Companion, then I wouldn't meet the requirement for iron. But, oh right, I figured out that I didn't actually need 50 iron. 
anymore. Because my plans have changed and none of my ship equipment actually requires it. Yeah, okay, so I'll switch over to Clay Conductor and Copper Companion at the next port. Oh, I just killed some bees and it turns out we can copy part of a lost sigil from the bees back. Remember, the Clerk of Sevens needs that. Look for lost sigils. You need... Wait, you need six? I thought I only needed like three. Anyway, uh, your weapons have damaged the corpse. The bee is a ruin of splintered wings and yellow-black bristles, and you can only reconstruct a fragment of the sigil, but it's a start. Yeah, with them assigned to my officer slot, I now have well over 75 mirrors and veils. Very mediocre iron and god-awful hearts, but I've achieved 75 plus in two different stats out of four. I think that's really good. All right, we are at... Old Tom's well, once again, it's been a long time. Let's just go straight in. Descend. You will land, but risk damaging your hull. We're fine. Let's read this again, just because I don't remember. Old Tom was a prospector during the promised days that followed London's arrival in the heavens. For years he combed the reach, looking for the strike that would make him rich. He didn't find it. Luckless and impoverished, he made a wish here at the well. The next month he discovered the mother of mountains and the rich hour veins that riddled her flanks. For a year before his disappearance, he was staggeringly wealthy. Others come here now, the desperate and the broken, with their final futile wishes. All right, we can take a sample here for the nature reserve. Like, I think I explored the beehive hovels before. Yeah, just a description. Nothing really happens. Um, the Kirk. Right, I have... I think I have the right from this well right now. Nah, okay, I don't, I don't think I want to do any of that. Ambition, descend into the well in the Baroness's bathysphere. It will take more than a day to prepare the equipment and anchor the winch in pulley. Your crew will remain behind to man it while you and the Baroness descend into the well. What the hell? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, do you see that description? Convey the Baroness and her bathysphere to old Tom's well. The well, and then... I don't know what that is. Some sort of ID number? Starts with directory, colon, some ID number? I can't imagine that's on purpose. Probably not. Let's go. Before the fall. The assembly is difficult. The well winds howl, dragging any unsecured tools or equipment over the edge. The cold bites, freezing fingers and faces. Picks and hammers break on the packed black ice. Eventually, the machinery is ready. The bathysphere poised at the well's edge. Below it is the roiling, thirsty depth. Blacker than oil. Blacker than pitch. Blacker than the space between the stars. Do you know, the Baroness says, in a low voice only you can hear. I'm not certain I can do this. Encourage her. When is she going to get another chance to explore the inside of a well? Hope I don't regret that and they end up dying. <laughs> quite right, quite right, she says with a weak smile. Let's get it over with, shall we? I don't think it's going to be a quick thing, I'm sorry to say. She clambers in, checking gauges and dials as you squeeze into the second seat. One of your officers closes the hatch, shutting you in. There's a sense of sudden vertigo as the sphere swings out over the well. Then, with a jerk, you begin to descend. The bones of the sun. The whale's tumult makes the bathysphere swing and spin. It's a rocky, nauseous descent. Soon the last light of the stars falters, and the windows are dark. But there's movement in that dark, like ink stirred into water. Movement in the dark. Turn on the lights to see, 
or just descend in the darkness. Perhaps it's better not to see. No, we're here to gather information. We're here to learn. We want to see everything. I'm coming in here with low terror. Let's take some chances. The Baroness had gas lamps fitted on the outside of the bathysphere. A broken kingdom. The light is feeble, but enough to limb the closest side of the well. You see towers and palaces crunched together and cemented by the ice. You see the wrecks of shattered locomotives. You see the bones of creatures caught in the well's pole, the flesh stripped from them by flaying winds. Best turn them off again, the Baroness says after a time. We may need to save the gas. According to the bathysphere's clocks, you descend for more than a day. Whoa. Then the winds begin to ease. The sphere stops spinning and swaying. There's an eerie calm, then a sudden grinding collision. Then silence. I think we've hit the bottom, the Baroness says. Her voice is bleak. We descended for more than a day? Is this sphere going to be able to get us out? Oh, I guess not the sphere itself, but... Right, we're attached to a winch and pulley, right? So I guess the ship is going to pull us up? Provided it doesn't get broken by the flaying winds? How are they going to know when to bring us up? Do we have an agreed upon time, or do we just... Tug on it and... Hope they can feel the slight tug? <laughs> from, I don't know, a hundred kilometers away through flaying winds, bashing against the rope as well. Uh, let's not think about it. Climb out. Unfastening your straps, you unlock the hatch and climb out. The Baroness hands you a lamp and follows. <clears throat> In the grave of a god, the ground is a compact, frozen scree of stellar detritus. Footing is perilous. You can hear the moan of the well winds far overhead, but the air here is still as stagnant water. Motes of dust hang unfalling in it. You make your careful way from the well wall and down the slope. Wait, the Baroness says suddenly and raises her lamp. The light gleams on something gold and gargantuan overhead. Crown is a compact, frozen scree of stellar detritus. What is scree? Ah, uh, scree is a mass of small, loose stones that form or cover a slope on a mountain. That didn't quite click for me, but if you just look at an image, then it makes sense. It's like... It's basically a bunch of broken up bits of rock that are completely covering, uh, like a slope going up a mountain, basically. So this is basically saying there's a bunch of frozen rocks of stellar debris underfoot. You stand amidst the gold bones of a sun. They vault an arch like a murdered cathedral, ribs as big as bridges, a curve of skull vast enough to dome all of London. You scramble like ants beneath them, discovering that their lengths are twisted and splintered, mangled by some impossible force. There's a pressure in your ears, as if unheard thunder was resounding around you. Unheard thunder? Huh. So, remember a messenger planted a well seed. It killed the sun, sucked it into it, I guess. And the sun ended up twisted and splintered, mangled by some impossible force. Collect a sample of the sun's bones. Do what you came here for, do not tarry. Or strive to hear the death cry of a fallen sun. Hell yes! Unlocked when nightmares is untroubled. Oh no, is that gonna put- Fuck. I think that's gonna put me to the highest nightmares. I don't know what happens when you get to the highest nightmares. Hmm. I can't leave without answers. No. I'm doing it. You leave the Baroness to collect the sample you need and make your way under the Skull Dome, where the pressure is most intense. The Last Testament. The pressure tightens. You hear distant thundering words accompanied by blazing visions. 
they rage against the son's death at the hands of a half-son, a midnight murderer. The killer sent false messengers bearing a well seed. They planted the seed in the son's heart and it bloomed, bloomed and ravened. A lawless killing, a shameful death enacted without due ceremony. Your mind abandoned its grip on consciousness as oaths of futile vengeance thunder through your dreams. <clears throat> when you awake, you're strapped into the bathysphere as it completes its final violent ascent from the well. The winds are roused, roaring at the sphere in a frenzy. Nearly there, the Baroness yells, and soon the sphere is deposited, smashed beyond further use onto the edge of Old Tom's well. Success. And in comparison to that, getting your sample back to the Baroness's laboratory in New Winchester should be easy. Your nightmares are now four, consuming, and I've gained a crimson promise. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about going to... I very, very, very briefly thought about going to Magdalene's <clears throat> to try to reduce my terrors before I came here. But I don't... I, I realize that I don't think I can actually reduce my nightmares there right now because I think I need more um, points of inspiration. I think I need two or three. And I think I only have one or something like that. Yeah. Let's read this again, this first part, because this is important lore. The pressure tightens. You hear distant, thundering words accompanied by blazing visions. The rage against the sun's death at the hands of a half-sun, a midnight murderer. The killer sent false messengers bearing a well seed. They planted the seed in the sun's heart and it bloomed. Bloomed and ravened, a lawless killing. A shameful death enacted without due ceremony. Yeah, so the messenger and the well seed thing, that we already knew. I didn't realize that it was planted in the heart of the sun. No wonder it's been rended apart if this thing started forming inside of the sun. <clears throat> also, the messenger was sent by a half sun, a midnight murderer. That's interesting. I've been organizing my notes recently. Wanted to uh, break out all the information that I have about the sons into their own little thing before they were just put into Elizabeth's general character sheet. But now I've got a whole thing just for sons and a couple categories, just conjunctions. Remember, that's other, those are like the political groups of sons. I know of three of them were very explicitly described to me. I think we heard of a fourth that I should have wrote down but forgot. Uh, but we didn't really have that described to me. I think I just have the name of that. And then for general information, I figure I should write, well, everything that I learn about the sons. <clears throat> we have this quote uh, that we got from the Royal Society. wanted to put that down. And also, of course, we just read this thing about... I, I think the Reach's son is called the Garden King. But the Reach's son, there should not be an E there. For the Reach's son, just a description of what happened. The messenger sent by the half-son, a midnight murderer. And then I just took a screenshot of that text there. Yeah. Okay. I'm waiting for my nightmares to actually go up. It'll probably go up once I leave the well, I guess, and we'll see what happens. A visitation. A new friend. The bristle mustache corpse takes you aside. He must speak with you regarding a matter of personal importance. In the solitude of your cabin, he breaks into brittle sobs. You watch beads of ice squeeze painfully from his tear ducts. Oh, that does sound painful. He's so lonely out on the hole. Could he not stay inside? He's picked out a cabin. Unfortunately, it's currently occupied. Eject your crew member. <laughs> hmm. Won't another empty cabin do? He shakes his rhymy head. <clears throat> it will not. It must be a recently occupied one. The empty cabins are so cold. Okay, my creepy friend. Regretfully decline. It simply wouldn't do to go around replacing living crew with dead ones. Surely he understands. He nods mournfully. You give him some privacy so that he can compose himself. 
When you return to the end of your shift, you find that he's made himself at home in your cabin. He's asleep in your bed. Iron-hard mustache bristles clog your sink. His soggy socks are steaming on the heating rail. <laughs> the cheek? You drive him out and collapse into bed. How cold the sheets are, how damp and hard with frost. You slip, shivering into white, barren dreams. Lost one hearts. <laughs> My poor, poor hearts. <laughs> you know, it's pretty fitting. It's like Elizabeth's... You know what? Yeah, actually, losing hearts. Let's say that's Elizabeth's condition. The brittle gla glass thing growing next to our heart. Let's say it's growing again. And every time we lose hearts, it's growing a little bit more. Taking over our heart, turning it hard and brittle. Ah. New. Right, so I want to get rid of nightmares really fast, but again, I don't think I have the stuff to do it at Magdalene's. I need inspiration. And I don't know where to get that. The Tenebraus. Just have to use my heart skill to get inside? Nah. Gained two tear. Oh, hello. Ooh. Oof. Hello, bees. Captain's cabin. Salon's dude gossip. You gonna attack me? No? Good. I think you have enough to contend with with that well. You must be fiercely beating their little wings. Back at New Winchester. Let's take the... was it the Baroness? Yeah, let's assist the Baroness in performing a solar autopsy. You have material from the corpses of both the Son of Albion and the Son of the Reach. What can you learn from them? The Baroness maintains a well-stocked laboratory in her cellar. You convene there to conclude your research. Well, I think we can do all of this, yeah. So let's first investigate what killed the Son of the Reach. You have the fragments of its bones to study. Goliath. The Baroness investigates. It was killed by a titanic, mangling force. Even the grain of its bone fibers are distorted. You deploy implements, acids, and the industrial vice she keeps in her laboratory to see if you can duplicate the effect, but find nothing able to generate the necessary pressure. Whatever did this to the sun, it was beyond the reach of mortals. Even the grains of its bone fibers are distorted. So I guess nothing really new here. It's the well seed that killed it. It mangled it from the inside. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Investigate what killed the son of Albion. Of course, Her Majesty claims that the King of Hours was defeated by the might of the Empire's navy. I've always had my doubts. Let's see, shall we? Don't forget the conversation we had with the Queen, confirming that it definitely was not killed by the Empire's Navy. But it didn't illuminate what did kill it, just what didn't. The Poisoner. Examining it through a microscope, it's immediately apparent that the Son of Albion wasn't killed by munitions, but by poison. It's worked its way into every golden cell. The poison itself you cannot isolate or extract. It's as insubstantial as a thought. You examine it more closely. The patterns of its spread are regular, like the strokes of a pen. You point this out to the Baroness. Fascinating. If only we had more. The lines look like fragments of correspondence sigils, don't they? Can words be poison, I wonder? Poisoned by correspondence. This should go in my notes as well. The Our King, or Albion's son, died from poison from 
words of correspondence. Investigate a mysterious noise from the back of the laboratory. The Baroness is otherwise distracted. It's coming from a heavy glass jar on a workbench. The jar rattles as something iridescent whirls inside. That's a sample of the peacock wind, the Baroness says, frowning. What's got it agitated? Shall we find out? You open the jar. The wind tears from it and across the lab to the slab of gold bone, where it rages in a brief localized hurricane that scatters equipment across the cellar. Then with an anguished wail it disperses. The Baroness climbs to her feet. I wonder, do sons have souls? Do they leave ghosts? There are a great many winds in the heavens, aren't they? So the Baroness is thinking that the peacock wind might be the soul of the, um, the Garden King? Because it went over to the bones, the gold bones. And then it raged like it was looking at its corpse, you know? Raging, seeing its dead body. And it's interesting, too, because the peacock wind... Sorry, I was just getting other ideas for other winds. The, the comment, there are a great many winds in the heavens, aren't there? Um, I'll come back to that in a second, though. Uh, remember, the peacock winds are they're a life-giving wind. They make things verdant. They make things grow just by being in it. It increases your terror, but it also restores your supplies. So the soul of that sun seems to be very alive, life-giving. And then I was just thinking about this. There are a great many winds in the heavens, aren't there? Remember the candle winds? Now I'm wondering, could that be a soul of a sun? A different one, maybe? Conclude your research. What have you learned? The Baroness ticks off points on her fingers. Firstly, that sons are not merely dying, they're being killed. And secondly, that the methods of their death are beyond the means of lesser beings. That in turn suggests that the things responsible are sons themselves, or entities of a comparable magnitude. <coughs> she frowns. I must say, this is rather grander than I'd anticipated. I see why I consumed our mutual friend. But I think that's all we can achieve for now. I'll continue to research this, but anything more will take time. I'd recommend you turn to another line of investigation for now, comrade. You've learned something you should not. Good. Right, we have two more. Who's next? So I'm going to be going to Eleutheria. Pan is in Eleutheria. Mr. Benagerie should be at the House of Rods and Chains, which is also in Eleutheria. So I guess I could take either of them. Hmm. Maybe I'll do the Pan one, because Pan is one of the first places I'm going to go in Eleutheria. House of Rods and Chains is a little bit out of the way. Yeah, convey the masked citizen to Pan. Perhaps we could take your engine? I'm not universally admired in Pan and may need to keep my head down. The citizen packs extensively before boarding your engine. No fewer than four trunks need to be carried aboard. All vital, I assure you. One of them is coffee. If I have to drink tea for a month, I'll go mad. Anyway, when we arrive at Pan, we should speak to the Cypress King, whoever it may be that week. Before they board, the citizen touches your arm. Let me ask you a frank question. Do you think our mutual friend is still alive? To my surprise, I've become entirely fond of her. God. Remember, Elizabeth really cares about the earnest agitator. We made a promise to protect them and have their back always. Yes, you're sure she still lives? The masked citizen nods. She is commendably resourceful. Good. It's always more satisfying to be fighting for something, yes? They board your engine, calling to Pan at the nearest engineer. 
The engineer, who possesses a clear understanding of the chain of command, looks to you. You nod to Pan. Ah, oh, 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 look at this. Travel to Pan and consult the Cypress King about the courtesy. I don't remember if we've talked about the courtesy with um, these four people that were helping out here. But remember, we just heard about the courtesy in the, the Ash Scroll or something like that. Scroll of Ash. That wasn't actually a scroll, but a library at the Forge of Souls, which mentioned that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands and thousands of stars had died because of the courtesy. <laughs> all right, that's all to do at New Winchester, I think. Well, hello, this is bad. The fire and the fury, it just popped up. I don't think I have a critical condition because I just repaired my hole, which cures all critical conditions. What if this is caused by going to the Blue Kingdom or by having Max nightmares, who knows? Or maybe pursuing the ambition quest? You're summoned to the engine room to discover a condition of emergency. The firebox thunders. Inside it, an inferno rages, its flames a stark, strobing blue. This is just like the lamps turning blue when we were in the Blue Kingdom. <coughs> the boiler creaks and rattles. It's beginning to overheat. The fires won't go out, Captain. Hmm. I can either starve the flames, which seems to be guaranteed, but my locomotive's gonna hurt while they burn out. Or fight them. 53% chance of success. This uses the crew, so I'm probably going to lose crew if I do that. No. Starve them. Your locomotive will suffer while they burn out, but you should be able to prevent a boiler rupture. Oof. 56 hull. Pipes shriek and split. Your locomotive threatens to shake itself apart. You ease the pressure where you can and make the most vital repairs. Eventually, the roaring fire dies down to a sullen sapphire embers. We'll come back, Captain, an engineer asks. You cannot answer. Well, good thing I am a mere, like, ten seconds away from New Winchester. Let's go get repaired. <laughs>